brief tool card running techniques and angle photics. Um, I presume you're all runners of some description, um, various levels. Um, do you have any running coaches here at all? Any physios? Anyone? Okay, so I will try and keep it as simple as possible so that uh, I can part a load of information over to you guys. Um, my history is that I'm a chartered sports physiotherapist and I specialise in running injuries. I've spent the last 18 years working in sport um, as a physiotherapist and about 10 years prior to that as a strength and conditioning coach and, and uh, worked with the army. Um, I still work for the army as a specialist looking at um, injuries in, um, in elite athletes in the army and those on special forces training. Um, and I continue to um, to work well with them, as well as working professional sport, as well as working private practice. Um, so it's quite a wealth of experience there. Um, and I've also had other specialisations in that I work very closely with nutritionists, strength and conditioning coaches, um, and also work with the, uh, many of you will talk on hydration later. Uh, I've also taken a load of courses in hydration, which um, I feel has a, a massive impact on performance in sport. So what I'm going to try and do today is give you an oversight into what running is all about, um, running techniques, use of robotics, and how we can use both to improve performance and prevent injury. Um, and then we'll get some questions and answers. I'm going to try and make it interesting, um, but um, I find it interesting, you guys may find it a very boring topic, but there we go. So, um, a lot of talk in, in the press at the moment about running technique all the time. It's uh, a big sales pitch out there, but basically um, biomechanics is the key to running technique, that's pure and simple, and you want to break biomechanics down to its bare basics, it's down to mathematics, and you can go on mathematics and physics, but we won't go into that. In general terms, biomechanics is the evaluation of movement, and that is what technique is, movement. Um, and when you look at biomechanics, you can look at the body as either the whole, look at the body as someone run, just look at Joey, look at them, say, oh, he's running well and go, oh, it looks good, okay, but, or you can break it down into the ankle joint, the knee joint, what's happening at the arms, what's happening at the shoulders, what's happening at the hip and pelvis, um, and it's the correct body, it's the correct body biomechanics that lead on to correct technique, okay, and it's the correct technique which leads to improved performance and prevention of injury. Um, so generally, um, body biomechanics gives you correct technique in running. Okay, so the correct biomechanics, if your body is working correctly, you get you can get correct technique. But there's ways you need to look at this. Um, two areas that I want to discuss, which are the main reasons why um, you get poor technique uh, at the moment, I think orthotics and footwear. Uh, greatly can produce poor technique or give you a little bit better technique and poor pelvic bone mechanics and I'm going to show you some video of that in a minute, two key areas. Um, if you can correct uh, what's happening at the foot and at the pelvis then generally your technique will, will, will improve dramatically. Um, running generally um, requires the body to absorb repeated strain. It's the only sport that I believe that you have it's a, a sexual playing movement pattern that is repeated time and time again, like a metronome, non-stop, for hours and hours and hours in some cases, week in, week, in, week out, day in, day out. Um, there's, no, there's no change. You, your body has its own metronome, its own motor system and it just continually does the same thing. That impacts repeated amounts of forces on repeated the same tissues. Um, let me try to explain. If you're a tennis player, you play four hours of tennis a day, but you're repeatedly doing different movement patterns. Every single shot you're making, both backhand, forehand, overhead, smash forwards, backwards, sideways, you do all different types of conditioning. Running is the same. The only things that may change is that you run faster uphill, faster downhill, faster on the flat, slow on the flat, and that's it, that's the only changes. So your stride length may change and resistance may change due to the terrain. But generally it's the same movement pattern. Um, and then because of that, every runner will have their own threshold where they will break down. 
doesn't matter who you are. Everyone will break down at some stage. And this is the great bit about me being a physio, because all of you will get injured. Okay? The average person gets two injuries per year, and generally running becomes an addictive sport. So what happens is you start off running three days a week, then it goes to four days a week, then it goes to five days a week, then it goes to six days a week, and then you increase your mileage, and then you do hill sessions, and then you join a club, and eventually you will break down. At some stage you will reach your, reach your threshold and you break down, you will either rest for two weeks and start again, and break down again, or you come and see me, and you go away, don't listen, and you break down again. And we have this cycle again, it goes on and on and on. And that's why runners have the highest incidence of injury there is in any sport, <coughs> in contact sport. And probably has even higher incidence than, than, than uh, any sport, really. However, it's all overuse, or, or under training, or under recovery, sorry. Um, and here are just a few stats. There you go, runners sustain injuries at alarming rate. 70% of all runners can be expected to get injured in one year. Very high percentage. Runners, runners define something that runs a, uh, runs a minute of 20 to 25 kilometers per week and running for up to one to three years. So to be classified as sort of a runner, you need to be doing over 25 kilometers per week and you need to be running for one to, two, one to three years. Um, and then there's a little bit there about muscle skeletal ailments and that is true to running. So anything that restricts your running is, a, is an injury. That little niggle that slows you down is, is an injury of some description. A full blown injury is anything that restricts your running or stops you running for longer than two weeks. So you start having a little bit of Achilles problems but you still carry running and but it's restricting your running and you think, oh, I won't do that 10 mile run, I'm just going to do a 5 mile run. That is an injury. Okay? That's, that is the. Look, that is the um, description of an injury. And if you if I was asked you always put your hands up, who here currently has, therefore listening to that, has some form of injury? There we go. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Cha -ching. Cha -ching. And can you so can you increase your mileage? Can you improve your performance? Carrying those niggles? The answer is no. Because all you're doing is it's increasing the stress and the strain on the body, which will therefore make the injury become worse or you know, and slow you down more. So you've got yourself in a downward spiral already. So there's, there's always a reason why this is happening. That's what everyone forgets. There's always a reason. You may not like the reason, but there's a reason there. And it's most likely due to overuse, i.e. overtraining, or under recovery is now the big term they now use. We don't talk about overtraining anymore, we talk about under recovery. Okay, or poor technique or biomechanics. But as I explained to you before, biomechanics make up technique. So, combined. <coughs> and here's some stats on number of injuries we get. So the majority of injuries occur even the knee, ankle, and foot. And as you probably imagine, I've now become an ankle expert and a knee expert. Okay, due to specialising in running injuries. Uh, and I work with all the top knee surgeons and ankle surgeons um, in the country. So um, I'm going to try and um, skip through this because I want to move on to a different... The, 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 here's just a list of common running injuries. Knee pain, internal medial machine pain, stress fractures, bone bruising, patellar tendinosis, plus fasciitis, Achilles tendinosis, internal round syndrome, run sleep, that's other knee pain. And probably some of you have either got them at the moment or have had suffered from them. And if you, su if you suffer from them, I just look at a pearl of wisdom. If you suffer an injury in running that's bilateral, what I mean by that is you get bilateral shin pain, bilateral knee pain, you've had ITB on both sides, you've had a kid's tendinosis on both sides, it's definitely attributed to biomechanical issues occurring at the foot and ankle. Okay? And if it's bilateral, you get knee pain in both knees, you go for a long run, and you've been running for one, two, three years, and there's no real trauma, and you're getting, coming back, and the next day you've got knee pain walking downstairs, it's probably something to do with your biomechanics of your foot, and that could be lessened. Uh, and when you do get these sort of like, um, how can you describe them, injuries whereby you finish a run, and the next day you've got knee pain, or you've got ITB pain, or you've got bits, tight Achilles, so you rest it for a few days and it goes away, it's all down to fatigue of the tissues that occur. Um, and if you can improve your technique or improve your biomechanics, 
you're going to reduce fatigue in those tissues when you're running, thereby allowing your threshold to go up a, a level, thereby allowing you to increase your mileage or your speed. But guess what? I've done this all with people before, and then all they do is they take it to the next level and the next level. So there is always an ultimate sort of level you can get to in, in every individual. Um, In physiotherapy, we always talk about extrinsic and intrinsic factors or external and internal stresses. So the extrinsic factors would be things like um, that would increase tissue stress would be running on, on tarmac. Um, intrinsic factors might be weak glutes at the pelvis. Um, extrinsic factors might be your shoes are old and lost all their cushioning. Um, extrinsic factor might be the fact you get up first thing in the morning, go for a very early morning run, um, and it's very cold, and your body's warmed up, and your, your, your body just isn't ready for running. Um, intrinsic factor might be uh, your ankle range of movement, or uh, lack of uh, dynamic flexibility. Um, so here are a few uh, extrinsic and intrinsic factors that, that can lead you break these two, two areas down, but what you get is you get technique as down as an ex extrinsic factor, and then you get biomechanics as an intrinsic factor. And that's why then the only two things that cross over, that's why technique and biomechanics are, go hand in hand. And that's why it's double whammy, really. So when you get an injury, it won't just be for one reason there will be multiple factors, both extrinsic and intrinsic factors that are causing the Achilles tendon tendinosis, uh, causing the ITB syndrome, causing the plantar fasciitis, causing the anterior knee pain, causing the shin splints. Okay, so when you come to a physio, and if they're a bit sort of like, I don't know what's causing it, or they give you a precise diagnosis, there are two extremes. I can guarantee you there'll be more than one reason why the injury is occurring and why your performance is being reduced. And this is why sometimes, as we go bottom here, you can you can sort of like go and have, uh, say you've got an ITB syndrome, you've got tight ITB band, you've got weak glutes, um, you've got poor foot biomechanics. You go to a massage therapist, she shreds out your um, IT band, it feels better, pain. They're treating the symptoms, not necessarily treating the cause, but it gets you through the run and it gets you to continue running um, and it keeps you where you want to be, which is out there hitting the miles. Um, not always the best thing, but you, you sometimes have to get all the factors and once you've got all the factors and dealing with all the factors then you, you are looking at long term recovery and long term performance gains um, so we want to very swiftly now ok um, this is a please feel free to argue with me here Please feel free to voice your opinions. I'm guaranteed some of you were hill strikers and have gone to barefoot and think it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, I have my, my beliefs, they're very strong beliefs based on proven science um, and also having worked with the shoe companies around. I know what they're trying to do um, and all I can do is give you the best bit of advice. There will always be those outside the normal rails where barefoot running or um, toe running will suit them, um, but you know we're not. But generally, the normal populations aren't so the buds of the world, and um, and as such, we, we I have to go down what I feel is the straight, the, sort of the, sort of the, the, the normal population. So, but feel free to voice your opinions. The, 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 the important thing is, everyone is an individual, and you can't typecast someone that that four foot running or mid foot running or hill strike running is, is the best form of running for middle distance running or long distance running. Um, everyone is an individual and a mid foot running technique may not suit someone and it will cause them an injury very very quickly. So if you go to a triathlon training camp and suddenly you've got a running coach there who advocates mid foot running because his best top athlete is a mid foot runner therefore it must be the best thing then it's, it's not right. It, you know, it may not be right for you. And the same as I, the same arguments I have with people who do cycling and have their bike set up. Just because one person's got a bike set up one way for his 
his body type doesn't mean that everyone should have that bike set up and they're going to improve their performance. So um, before I go on to show you some video, um, just going to give you a bit of advice. Um, if you've never run, adopt a running style that you feel comfortable with. Okay, Don't worry about anything else. Adopt a, um, a running style that you feel comfortable with and it's natural to yourself. And with that, also adopt a pair of running shoes that feel natural and comfortable. Don't go on price, don't go on brand, don't go on the market. Um, and it's a very undervalued, underrated um, element of runners' training, strength and conditioning, because runners just want to run. Same as yoga people want to stretch, they don't want to do strength and conditioning, and the same as um, weightlifters don't want to do any cardiovascular work. You know, it's, it's good. And if you are going to do strength and conditioning exercises for your running technique, they need to, need to be specific to that, and I'll move on to that in a bit. If you do change your running style, so say you're a hill striker and you go to some lecture and you've got someone from Pose or sort of like a minimalist uh, coach or you know, barefoot running technology, whatever they've got out there now, and they're advocating you to change your running style, you've got to take probably at least three months of solid of stop running to change your running style and just concentrate on strength and conditioning for a particular running style, you're going to change how your foot lands. It takes a long, long time for your body to learn a movement pattern that will stop you through. Okay? You can't just suddenly go from, if you've been running for 20 years, landing on your heel and rolling forwards, to suddenly landing on your midfoot and driving backwards and doing that repeatedly 1,600 times per mile, which is the average number of steps you take per mile, and repeat that for like five miles and not get injured, you have to spend, and it takes two to three months in any form of a strength conditioning program to actually to have phys physiological changes to be take, take place long term. And to me that's very, very difficult because I don't know one runner who will take three months off to do that. Um, you know, it's like, it's like someone trying to change Tiger Woods golf swing and see what happened there. And they try to change his golf swing, and they probably contract for about a month, he went to the next tour the next before he realised that he's injured again. It, it, it's very, very difficult. A um, couple other tip, bit of tip tops. Uh, when looking um, at increasing your running speed, try and increase your cadence first before increasing stride length. Too many coaches out there say increase your stride length, increase your stride length. As you increase your stride length, you change your biomechanics. If you change your biomechanics, you change your technique. If you change your technique, you need it will result in high instances of injuries because you haven't done strength conditioning to go with the change in technique. So before you start to increase, if you're going to increase your running speed, look at increasing your cadence, which is the speed of motion of your feet rather than the length of stride, first of all. Once, you, once you've increased your cadence, if you then want to go even faster still, you increase your strength and conditioning to go with that and then slowly lengthen your, 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 your running stride length. With that, you know, your, your technique will change, but hopefully with the strength and conditioning being built in at the same time, the less likely of injury. Um, as you get fitter, as you get stronger, as you do more mileage, you have to do more strength and conditioning. If you run once a week, don't bother about it. <coughs> you go out for one five mile run a week, don't worry about strength and conditioning. If you want to run five, da five days a week, you need to put in at least three strength and conditioning sessions a week. If you want to run six days a week, you need to put more strength and conditioning in. Okay? The more you do, the more strength and conditioning you need. Okay? It's, it's paramount to preventing injury and actually improving performance. You will not just improve performance just by increasing mileage and more energy mileage. You will be at high risk of injury. Um, the incidence of injury doubles over 25 miles. So once you've once since you go over 25 miles per week, the risk of injury doubles. So as soon as I get any of my athletes get to 25 miles per week of running, I'm increasing their strength and conditioning before I start to take them up to 30 miles a week or 35 miles a week. And that's it. So that's quite a good exercise if anyone wants to try it. <laughs> it this, is, this, 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 this exercise here really strengthens what we call the lateral swing systems. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's a system that, that runs up in a fascia 
that crosses over the body here and there and this side and it stabilizes you when you're landing on one leg. The only problems I was having with that is that's a static, static um, exercise and running is a dynamic exercise. So if you did that for four hours a day, you'll be very good at that exercise. It wouldn't necessarily include your running technique, okay? <laughs> but it, 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 it's part of strength and conditioning that you should be doing some of these type of exercises. Um, and obviously it's low low very. Okay. I'm going to quickly switch over now and show you some video. Has anyone got any questions? No? Sure? Have I wrapped it on a bit too quick there? Okay. Here, here's a patient of mine um, quite some time ago. But um, I use this, this one quite a lot because she had been to see a, a podiatrist, been to physios, had, had knee pain, lateral knee pain. And uh, and she was complaining of this that natural knee pain, and she'd been around the shops, and she told to come and see me because I was going to fix her. Um, and and after hearing all the physios she's been to, and all the podiatrists she's been to, and all the orthotics she's been to, I said uh, there's there, there's no way um, that I was actually going to fix her. So so the first thing I'm going to look at is a biomechanics and a technique. I, I, I have I have no issues with, with people running on heel heel strike. Um, it's natural for me. It's it's how we absorb shock. It's how we propel ourselves forward. And for long distance runners, um, I, I definitely believe you get a lot less injuries. Um, and when you start looking at um, all the top marathoners, if you watch the London Marathon, uh, look at the finish. Look at all the top 30, 40 marathon runners going through. Look at how many of them are heel striking compared to midfoot running. And they're still do, and they're still doing sub five minute miles. So, um, and they run two, three marathons a year max. Um, and they're doing sort of like max 70 miles a week, probably someone might do 100. Um, but uh, they're still heel striking. So, my advocation is um, that there's no evidence behind midfoot running to be the best. Um, so, yeah. but if we just take this person landing here, we're, look, we're, look, we're looking at her, her heel strike here. Um, she's landing on a heel strike, and the foot's in, it's in a relative neutral position, which is good on landing. Uh, she lands, um, she was told that she needed orthotics, uh, looking here at through her pelvis, she pronates a bit, knee comes across a bit, calcane, and she does pronate a bit, but nothing massively. Um, and, um, and her pelvis is not too bad up here. So these are the two things we're looking at now. We're looking at um, the biomechanics of the lower limb. So she's a mild to moderate overpronator at this stage here. But this wasn't the affected side, and she had orthotics. Um, now, the affected side was this side. Here she's landing. If you look at her pelvis there, that is what is causing her injury at this stage. Now then, that is poor running style. Poor biomechanics at the pelvis. Um, you ask me what's causing that. I'm telling you it's not, it's not her lower limb biomechanics that's causing that. Okay? That is motor control and muscle control and lack of strength and conditioning. And you probably found out that if you go right back in her history, she may have had right lower back pain or had an injury whereby she was on that side, the muscles were affected at some stage when she was young. doesn't have back pain now, but certain muscles were switched off and she's lost the ability to fire them on heel strike through mid stance. Um, so what I do, put on a strength and conditioning program. Two months later, she's back running, no problems at all, no orthotics required. Okay. Um, and if she wants to... The problem is she came back again and again because every time I got to a certain level of strength and conditioning, she just increased her mileage. So the stress tissue stress levels. So whenever you're coming back from injury, you give you go and see a physio and they give you a load of exercises, whether it's eccentric loading for your for your Achilles or your clams or your glutes. They're all very basic load of exercises to get you back to pain free, to get you slow by like running. But if you want to get up to 10, 15, 20 miles, you've got to increase your conditioning with that as it goes along. Okay. So we'll leave <coughs> her, her alone. And I'm going to go to now <coughs> my favourite person, Oliver. So if this is the right one. Now he, he is a, which is the wrong one there. He is a 235 marathon runner. And when I saw him, he's now a GB giraffe league. He gave up marathon running. Um, 
my, when I first saw him, he, um, he'd never had an injury ever. And when, when, I, when I quizzed him about him and his running, he was a barrister. He ran three times a week, and, he, and the maximum he could run was 10 miles a week on each run. And then prior to London Marathon or whatever he was doing, he, he was in the elite class. He might go out on Sunday, go out and do a 15 or 20 mile run. Um, but he, 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 he was a, um, he was a very, very good runner. But he's only doing 30 miles a week max. Those three runs he did were maxed out. You know, he, he, he wasn't hanging about. You know, he, he, he really wasn't hanging about. And he never got injured. So I, I looked at him and he came in to me, he wanted to do a screening. I said, well, I'm not going to do anything with you. And he, he keeps on being getting told he should wear um, entrepreneurial shoes. I looked at his feet and I said, oh, yeah, maybe you should, but I don't agree with them. But um, he didn't. He wore neutral shoes because he said they were the most comfortable, which is what I believe in as well. You pick shoes that are comfortable. So then I started to look at his biomechanics. I looked at him running. I looked at his pelvis. So you want to see someone here with good, strong stability. That's this guy here. That's good technique, good, strong stability working through through the pelvis on both sides. But he never, he's not having an injury there. He's not having an injury. And it's quite interesting because if you look at um, his technique and his body alignment, which is all part of technique as well, um, relatively from here and across here, everything is pretty good. All within normal limits. But take a look at his ankle joint. I'll give you a close up in a minute. If, oh, I should have uh, got the sun shining in. Um, I'll get another. I'm going to pull up. Right, I don't know if you can see this. Right. So take a look at his left leg on landing. So as you can see, he's landing. Nice heel strike here. You can't, you can't see too many toes on either side. Um, so that's, a, that's showing that he's not towed out or towed in. And, and then you see what happens at his ankle joint here. Can you see how much he's pronated over? This guy never had an injury. So the two things that, that, that meant he didn't have an injury. One, his mileage was low, but a very, very high level runner. Two, he had really good, strong core stability, strength and conditioning at the pelvis. Okay. I didn't change him. I wanted to give him orthotics. I, if, if, you know, if this was my daughter or something like that, I'd be like, yeah, you need orthotics straight away. Same as this leg here, look, right over. Now then, he went and changed sports. He went and became a GB giraffe leader. Got so addicted to it, his mind went through the roof, his training went through the roof, and he was in to see me within weeks with an Achilles tendinosis, which he'd never had before, and a groin injury. Guess why? Because he changed his sport, changed his techniques, changed his running. He was going from a uh, a marathon runner to a, a faster pace running, getting off the bike from a collapse machine, all things. He was a very, very fit guy. He was GB giraffe league, like that. So I said, right, we've got unloaded tension, and we gave him orthotics, not had another injury since. But up until then, you know, he, he had the conditioning, the right conditioning for his sport, and he had the right technique for his sport. And this is what happens when you change things. You have to be very careful that you do. So my advice is, if, if I had to do one thing to people to get them to reduce injury, it would be strength and conditioning, okay, first of all. Secondly, would be look at your ankle biomechanics um, and your foot biomechanics. Um, and that would be the next thing that I'd be looking at to prevent injury. And put those two together, hand in hand, you have a very, very good chance of reducing injury and going to increase performance and improve your technique. Is there any questions on that? Has anyone got any burning questions? Is that the sort of thing interested in? Okay. Um, I'm going to try and move on now. Is um, does anyone has does anyone have orthotics um, or um, insoles of any description? Yeah. And were they all for injuries or were they for just to improve performance? Injury. Injuries. Yeah. Performance. Performance. Were we working for performance? So. What sort? So you went to, so you had yourself assessed to improve your running technique or just to 
Um, I actually went back to something that I'd used previously um, that the manufacturer had stopped producing, right. um, and that made a rather large difference. Right. I made two changes at the same time, one of which was to change the size of the shoe. Right. The second one was to go back to using a, got on me a, a cushion arch support instead. Um, cushion? Just the little arch, arch cushions. Arch cushions? Yeah. And, you, and, that, and that helped you in what way? In performance wise? Twenty-five minutes of a marathon. Yeah. Okay. And why do you think that is? Um, in <laughs> it will be down to improved rolling technique on the foot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I'm no longer rolling out; it's all straight through. Yeah. Um, I'll, 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 I'll move on to that in a minute because it, it sort of comes into that last part of the, of the talk here. Um, so here, here's here's why people come and see me. Uh, for orthotics, um, want to even maximise performance. Um, I mean, at the moment, running shoes are massive, mass really marketed massively at the moment. Um, I would always take everything with a pinch of salt from the running shoe industry. I really would. I've worked with them. I know them very well. There's no clinical trials being done out there, and if there are being done out there, they don't show them to anyone. I, I personally would say, if I was a running shoe design manufacturer and I had a top uh, clinical biomechanics guy and I paid him to do research and that research was positive towards those running shoes, I would be pushing it out there amongst the world saying these running shoes have been proven to prevent injury. There's not one bit of clinical research out there in all the years of uh, shoe manufacturing. It's all market research. When I've approached them, they refuse to give it to me. But they asked me to research, do research for them, but all but it's all very anecdotal. The one guy who did do some research for them was a guy called Nick in, um, in America. And he, you, you may have seen him on TV actually, they did this whole program about drinks and stuff, uh, a panorama program. Um, and he, uh, he, he got sponsored by, he, he got, um, his research was sponsored by um, Nike. Um, and the outcomes of that was that Nike wouldn't let him publish it. <laughs> <laughs> he went ahead and published it and they, they withdrew all their funding. But he was the top, yeah, and, and that's on nutritional systems and whether or not it was beneficial or not, and whether it actually reduced impact or reduced injury compared to other cushioning systems. Um, there was no evidence for or against cushioning systems. Um, and he's got a lot of good paradigms which I could spend all day talking about, which I'm not going to talk about. What's his last name? Sorry? What, what's Nick's last name? It was Nick. Nick. It's Professor Nick. Professor Nick, right. Yeah, okay. NIWG. You yeah. look at some of this yeah. his work. Um, so the idea of, of having running shoes and orthotics is basically to try, this is what we, um, there's more clinical evidence behind orthotics than are behind running shoes, okay? So if you're going to waste, you know, 200 quid, you know, or you think you're wasting 200 pounds, waste on a pair of orthotics that have got more clinical research behind it, and buy a cheap pair of running shoes, and buy a really expensive pair of running shoes that are meant to be anti-pronation, do this and do this and do that. And literally, you know, you have to replace them every three months, six months, and potentially, in my view, can cause injury. And I know things like the Brooks Beast, I, I would stay, stay well away from. You know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually becoming more in favour of running shoes, like the Nimbus running shoes, because that they, they were the like the original neutral shoes 25 years ago. They just reinvented the wheel again. Neutral shoes today, like the Sulconi uh, Triumph or the Asics Nimbus were like mild stability pronation shoes 20, 25 years ago. They just added bits and bobs to them, made them very thick, quite heavy, um, uh, lots more cushioning, and there's no evidence to show that massive amounts of cushioning will prevent injury. There's actually evidence to show it can actually increase injury in some people. Um, I'll try and give you uh, a description. I, this is, I, I do like to talk about this a bit. Um, if you see children put on a pair of uh, cushioned shoes, when they're young, they, they don't. Children that have much feedback come back through their feet. That's why I advocate they do walk around in bare feet as much as possible in their early childhood, so they can they get proprioception and build up intrinsic muscles, and they start to walk. When you put them in shoes and trainers, they start slapping their feet a lot more. The reason they're slapping their feet is to gain a brown reaction force to stimulate muscles in order for things to to proprioception, to fill the proprioception, fill the floor. The same thing happens in adults. They prove it time and time again. If you put someone in a really, really, really cushioned shoe, you'll get up and you go, oh yeah, 
these feel good. And when you run, you actually will land with a harder heel strike to get the same proprioceptive feedback that your body needs, requires to have technique and the correct biomechanics for the muscles to fire. So what they do is, the, um, and, and, and you can actually see this yourselves when you um, run bare feet. So if you were to all take your shoes off now, take your socks off, go out running out there in the street, running along the roads, you'll find running on concrete quite tender to start off with. After about five minutes of running on concrete, your, your, your body will adapt, the proprioceptive will change, your muscle tuning will change, and the body will soften itself to absorb the shock through the concrete, and you'll find running on concrete quite comfortable after a while. This is where barefoot technology comes from, I don't necessarily agree with that. If you were going to carry on running and suddenly ran onto a really, really sandy, soft beach, you've all done it before, your knees give way, you go, ooh, knees give way, and, you go, oh, can't. and the body has to retune itself again. So what it does, it retunes itself, and after about 5-10 minutes of running on a sandy beach, you find that you, the body's stiffened up, and it's able to run on sand more comfortably, and you're more stable, and everything else. It's still hard work, because it's still with sand, but your body tunes itself to the sand. And if you're able to run back onto the concrete again, you'll be hopping around for the first 5 minutes, until the body relaxes itself and retunes itself to that, that ground. The same thing happens with trainers. You buy a really, really, really expensive, high cushion training shoe, very, very thick, some people's bodies tune, and, and, and by the way, we all have different tuning sort of parameters. So one person will find it really easy to run a concrete, whilst me, I find it very... It, the EVA substance degrades quite quickly. Uh, the other pearls of wisdom here, is buying second-hand, not second-hand, buying sale price trainers off websites that a last year's model could have been sitting on the shelves of shops for a year. As soon as they're manufactured, the EVA starts to degrade from the moment it's manufactured. Also, if you're running continuously, day after day, you need to have two pairs of running shoes. Okay? The reason being is, when you land on an EVA midsole, it compresses. It compresses. At the end of the run, it will be compressed. It takes 24 to 48 hours for it to recover. If you therefore go out and run the next day, you're running already on a compressed sole, so you're increasing the risk of injury, because the compression is still there and hasn't recovered yet. That is why you have two pairs of trainers. But if you're, if, if you're alternating, I always advocate that you should only run three to four times a week and have a rest day in between doing other types of conditioning training. Okay, because um, you should do quality training. That, that's my, my personal belief. Um, but that's, that's why you would have two pairs of trainers to, to run day after day. Okay, because it doesn't, the, the shoe doesn't recover. If you're wearing a minimum shoe anyway, does that really matter? Yeah. You still, you still have the cushioning there, you, you need some cushioning, but it, it, affects, it affects the performance of the shoe, and therefore it affects the, uh, the ground reaction forces, which therefore affects your proprioception, which therefore affects your technique. Yeah. So, it, it may be minimalist, it may be that, but it, it, it's injuries occur over long periods of time or short periods of time, you know. Um, this is what I'm trying to say about clinical evidence, there's very li limited clinical evidence out there, what evidence I, there is out there, I'm trying to impart upon you. It's the same as like with running shoes. Uh, the, run, the cushioning effect in running shoes varies with temperature massively. So you go out running in the mornings when it's like minus two, minus four, uh, the cushioning effect is different than when you're running it in 28 degrees. Mm -hmm. But you try and get the shoe companies to show, the, show you the clinical difference and, and how it affects the trainers and anything else. No, very limited, but we do know that it affects it because people take EDA and have shown that EDA is, is massively affected by temperature. Same as the body is, same as you are. You know. So. Um, um, sort of things. Um, the reason I like orthotics is <coughs> it can control biomechanics. <coughs> if you can control your biomechanics and alter your biomechanics, you can control your technique and improve technique. If you can improve technique, you can reduce strain and stress on the body, thereby either, either reducing injuries or increasing mileage and performance quite rapidly. Okay, um, that's the bottom line. Um, uh, but they help it by actually correcting your biomechanics to the forefoot, which I can go on the, or, or the rear foot. But the other ways they, they improve um, technique is by improving proprioception, um, which is one of the biggest things that I, I like about them, is if your foot is in the correct position when it's landing and rolling and coming back, it means the, the proprioceptors in the ankle joint and, and the capsule and the tissues around it are in the correct position. That means they fire correctly, if they fire correctly through the correct proprioception, you, you're going to improve performance and you're going to reduce injury. Um, 
very, very important. And it helps reduce things like muscle fatigue of the lower limb. And when you're looking at repeated strain of 1,600 times per mile of landing repeatedly, then, um, and you can, even if you can reduce it by 10%, that fatigue, that is massive when you're looking at what you runners do. This is why I'm saying orthotics are so important in runners because if you can reduce that fatigue down by 10%, that means your 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 training load will go up by 10% and your performance goes up by 10 10%. And this is when you're talking about long distance running, 25 minutes here, 25 minutes there, that becomes a lot. Um, there are lots of types of orthotics. I'm just going to give you um, advice on if if you feel that um, you want to improve your biomechanics or your technique or your performance, or if you have injuries and want to reduce the strain and stress on those injuries, you do need to get be biomechanically screened and, and looked at and have your running technique looked at and have your foot looked at. There's a lot of people out there selling orthotics. There's a wide range of prices, there's a wide range of products and there's a wide range, range of clinical experience. Personally, I believe you pay for what you get when it comes to orthotics. Um, my view now has changed over the years. Um, when I originally had my first pair of orthotics, uh, probably about 15 years ago when I was in the army, um, they made them rigid um, to try and control biomechanics. I completely disagree with that now. It can help some people, but generally I feel it doesn't. The foot is a mobile, um, it's a mobile unit. It, it wants to land, so that's the foot landing, it wants to land. Uh, so we had, as you saw the pictures, it wants to land like Oliver, and it wants to collapse and it wants to roll. On landing, rolling, it absorbs shock. As we come through onto what we call the mid stance of the foot, the foot is meant to resupinate in order to push off on all our metatarsal heads. As it resupinates, it becomes a rigid lever, which propels us forward with all the tissues in correct alignment. And it gives us a lot more rigidity to propel ourselves forward with a lot more efficiency. So, if you're um, a pronator, you may land, roll in like that, and as you push off, you'll see that. And then we go, oh, that's poor technique. Why don't you take their heels out like that? Mm -hmm. Oh, look, look, they look like running like a duck, like this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that's because of their foot biomechanics. If you correct that, you may, may, you'll be able to reduce that. So instead of them doing that, they're taking off, they'll be driving through and coming forward, okay? Um, the orthotics I like are normally are still rigid, but we call semi-rigid, and they're made from material that is springy and, and, and it's, it's mapped to the foot. So as the foot lands, you have the control postings on the rear or the forefoot to correct the bottom case we talked about. It allows the foot to roll still, it allows the foot to collapse still, but then helps the foot to come back to the neutral position as quickly as possible so it can propel itself forward. That's how you produce performance. If it's rigid, the foot will just land and go plonk. And this is where antipronation shoes come in. They have rigid or harder um, insoles on the inside of the shoe. It pre prevents the shoe from rolling over, but doesn't prevent the foot from rolling over in the shoe. And that's why they're heavier and don't actually control biomechanics, they just control the, <coughs> the shoe biomechanics, not the foot biomechanics. That's why I've seen there's no evidence out there that can show that they can actually uh, work. If you want to get clinical evidence, look up the last 50 years, these have been researched by podiatrists and physios, and we wouldn't be allowed to prescribe it even in the, in the NHS or here if there wasn't any clinical evidence behind it. I find it very difficult to prescribe shoes to people because there's no clinical evidence behind it. I do that. Uh, I do have my, my views, and, and, and the views I have are from, again, from clinical evidence. Um, I'll quickly move through this. This is quite interesting why orthotics don't work. I'm more than happy, if someone's had orthotics in the past that haven't worked, I'll be more than happy at any stage to biomechanically review you and tell you why they haven't worked. Okay? Um, however, Going forward, <coughs> at the bottom there, one of the big reasons is strength and conditioning. That's why a lot of them don't work. Because uh, we're running out of time now. Um, I, I, I personally believe when it comes to trainers, you want to pick a pair of trainers. Pick, a, uh, pick up something that is lightweight, wherever possible. Not ultra lightweight, but lightweight. Um, because force equals mass times acceleration, and the heavier the shoe is, the greater the amount of forces we're going through the foot. Okay. Um, generally go for a neutral shoe. If you've got adverse foot biomechanics, get a pair of orthotics to go in them. Get it sorted correctly, 
transfer around and go, and go there. And change your shoes regularly. Um, I know you've got a guy over there who's doing loads of miles, isn't there? Great, he's doing fine. It's all great. That's what I love about runners. You know, they're not getting injured, they just carry on doing it until they get injured and then they come, then they think, oh, I better go and change my trainers now. Well, you know, I'm like, maybe you should change it before you've got injury because it takes three months to get over the Achilles tendinopathy. Okay? Um, and, you know, so it's up to you. Um, um, we, we talked all about this. Um, now, this is what I was going to come up. This is the only bit of research I have found done by British General Sports Medicine on running shoes. I did a couple of bits of research project. This is their conclusions. This is from a top, top leading journal. They said that advertising footwear may represent a public health hazard and may need to be regulated. regulated. They were talking about asking, and did, a bit like non smoking, to put a health hazard on running shoes. That was from the, that's from the British General Sports Medicine. A massive trial that was done. They took a placebo um, of things. Of, of, um, if anyone knows anything about, does anyone work in sales here? Marketing, sales. Does anyone like, no one? No one? All right. Anyone understand psychology of persuasion? Mm. Yeah. You go to a running shoe shop. Running, running shoes come in three, three, basically three categories. Expensive, mid-range, and cheap. Why do they have to cheap ones? Do you think it's because people will buy cheap trainers? No. They have the cheap ones, so you buy the mid-trainers or the more expensive trainers. The cheap trainers actually are made from the same materials as the expensive trainers, they just have less gimmicks on them. And they're cheap to push you guys up. Okay? They did a trial where they had using cheap trainers and expensive trainers, and the people chose, were well, all blind, double blind studies, and everyone, and basically it was the mid-range trainers and the cheap trainers that people preferred. But as soon as they showed them the price, psychology pushed them up the other end of the scale. Um, And this whole thing about technology and reinventing the world and everything else and not having a clean boat is, is very paramount in the shoe industry. And this is why I hate when they change things like at the moment barefoot running is in that moment. Big thing, barefoot running, all your toes and all that, you know, anyone else. Yeah, great. If you like it, you like it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. If you want me clinical evidence behind it, there is none. If you're going to go to it just because you think you've got an injury and it's going to make a difference, think twice. It may help, it may not help. It's more likely that if you're going to go to a new technique and you do it properly, you will do strength and conditioning for that new technique. So you think, oh, I'm going to learn a new technique, so I'm going to do the strength and conditioning and do all that they say. Great. If you do strength and conditioning now, with the injuries you've got at the moment, with your actual running style you've got at the moment, you'll probably have the same outcome, would be my advice. Um, and so it's all doing with them now. Um, You've got two more talks after this. Some of you are on the strength and conditioning one. I do strength and conditioning, but I'm going to do it here. Um, but the strength and conditioning is, is paramount to prevent injury and improve performance and improve the technique. Biomechanics, paramount. If you've got poor biomechanics or you've got, um, I mean, even my top athletes, um, I've got, let me show you. Is anyone here, what, does anyone, talk about, does anyone here want to talk about midfoot running? Does anyone understand midfoot running? Does anyone thought about changing their style to midfoot running or pose or barefoot running? I changed mine about 18 months ago. Right. And, and, and do you feel you run a good midfoot running style? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to very quickly, because generally I find that people who change to midfoot running actually aren't midfoot runners. They land on a midfoot running, but they don't actually achieve midfoot running style. Um, I might go get some. How do you know which kind of runner you are in the first place? Do you, is that, do you need a screening to tell you that? Yeah, I do. I like to video people because I see so many different things. It's like I say, I have people coming here and tell me one thing. I look at them, they land on their midfoot, but they actually don't achieve midfoot uh, running style. Basically, what happens is on. Um, on landing, they um, get this to work. Basically, what happens is midfoot running, she landed in midfoot, 
and the foot is meant to stay off the ground and you pull yourself through using glute control and hamstrings which requires an incredible amount of conditioning. But what I generally see is that people land on their midfoot and then they go back down to their heel and then they push off again. Uh, whereas normally you'd land, heel strikers land, hit, roll, push off. This one they land, that, that. So you, that's your break and fall stair, then you go backwards, then you go forwards again, you know, sort of over it. This is, this is a top international triathlete, Ironman triathlete, uh, called Tamsin Lewis. Um, she's, um, she has orthotics, but she doesn't have poor football mechanics. But then she, um, but then she would uh, not listen to me when it comes to training, because typical triathletes as well. But she's a midfoot runner here, landing here, I don't know if you can see, I'm sure I do. Lines up. Um, she holds her foot there, she pronates a bit, holds her foot off the ground. As she's pulling forward through here, her heel is still off the ground, holding it there. And her stability at the top here is, is really good. Um, but her right leg, which she used to have problems with, mm. heel hits the ground and she internally rotates a bit more. So basically, you know, she was coming for me for answers, and the answers were it's all about conditioning of her lower limb. Now, the problem here is I see someone do this in five minutes worth of video. Now, she's a top international Ironman athlete. She doesn't start her running until sort of like six hours into um, training, into, into her event. And then she's running for two, two, you know, you know, two hours or something. So, you know, on the marathon. So, um, you've, got to, you've got to say to yourself, I look at her and say, that's not a bad running technique. But what's her form like after two hours of solid running? And this is where strength and conditioning comes in. You cannot maintain solid form through just running. Rowers cannot maintain their form in a rowing boat just through running. Now you have to do the strength and conditioning to go through with that to control that for long periods of time. Um, but that, that, that was one of the, the better forms of, of running style. And when I look at someone, I look at their running style, I look at their technique, I look at their biomechanics, I listen to their injuries, I look at their history, look at their, look at their training program, look at the actual current problem, and look where they want to go. And, then I, and that takes me about an hour, sometimes two hours. And at the end of it, you get your goals, you get your plans, and we get how we're going to achieve that. And that means I say you have to go off to a um, you know, boot camp, and do three months of conditioning training, you know, to help you improve your running technique and improve your conditioning. If that means you need to go and see a physio to have dry needling to get the tendinopathy sorted out, if that means you need to have um, um, foot orthotics to help control that bi the biomechanical errors occurring at the foot, and that means you need to go and have massage because you've got a really tight IT band, or you need to do foam roller program, or whatever it is, and this is what you have to do. Oh, and that means you have to cut down your mileage from 70 miles a week down to 25 miles a week. That's what you have to do. But eventually you will get back and eventually you will improve your performance, improve your technique, improve your running. But running upon running upon running will not get you there. And again, put your hands up. How many of you got an injury at the moment? Some description? There you go. And, you're, and, and who's not running at the moment? So a lot of you are still running with injuries. And do you think that injury is going to get better? Yeah. By running? Yeah. yeah. Well done. Well, I hope it does. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with Liam now.